Hello friends, and welcome to my new video, in which I'll tell you some amazing stories. But before we begin, please subscribe to my channel and hit the like button on this video. Also, don't forget to write your thoughts about these stories in the comments. Let's get started. The first story is, HOA towed my car because it was turned the wrong way. But I'm not a member of the HOA. I live in a neighborhood where there used to be an HOA, but then the old HOA ceased to exist, and now a parody of an HOA appeared here. I'm not a part of this new HOA, but these a-holes don't care. They're trying to operate on the fact that I was in the old HOA and signed a lifetime agreement with them. You can't even imagine how hard and funny it was for me to hear these words from them at the same time. It was hard because at the time we had been discussing my membership in the HOA for months and I had repeatedly told them to leave me alone because I had neither the money nor the desire to be part of their HOA. But that's what these a-holes are. They just don't leave people alone. Judging by their own logic, an HOA is something like some kind of disease that you can't cure because you were part of the HOA once. As is often the case, they wanted me to pay them money every month for at least breathing the air on the territory of the HOA. Is this normal? No, this is not normal. I consulted with lawyers, and they all told me not to give them a single penny, because all the contracts they used are old. No matter how much this new HOA wanted to, even the contracts they showed me were invalid, not only because they were conducted with the old HOA, but because they were overdue. When the HOA realized that I wasn't going to pay them, they started to act. The leaders of the HOA first started to make sure that most of the neighbors disliked me and my family. Some of the things they said about us reached us, and we were honestly shocked that someone could even come up with such stupid information. Of course, they were only telling bad things about us and only made up. To be honest, it didn't really affect me personally, and I won't say anything on behalf of my family members, but it seems to me that they didn't really care either. But the appetites of the HOA started to grow. It was not enough for them that everyone started to think that we were some kind of a-holes for whatever reason. They needed to make us feel their actions more. We realize now that they started the second phase when we magically got scratches on our brand new SUV. To be honest, we didn't think at first that someone from the HOA would ever do such a thing. To be more precise, we didn't realize for a long time that it was the HOA that scratched the car, but more on that later. Well, think about it. They're adults. What adult in their 40s would go to spoil someone else's thing like that? For some people, it may not have been a lot of money, but for us, it cost us a lot of money. We worked as a family, saved up penny by penny to buy this car, which finally fits all of us together because our old car didn't fit all of us together, and it really prevented us from living the way we wanted to live. There were a lot of events that we missed out on solely because we couldn't all go there together, and it's not family friendly to go there without taking some family member, so no one went. Public transportation is poorly developed in my area, so that was not an option. But I'm sorry, I got a little off topic. After the HOA scratched our car, some time passed, some things on our land were also damaged or destroyed. But the culmination of all of this was that one day when we came home from the store and saw that our car was not in our parking lot and there was some cardboard lying there. After reading the text, we realized that the HOA had taken our car because it was turned in the wrong direction, as allowed by the status of the HOA. To say we were shocked is an absolute understatement. We called the local sheriff, who turned out to be our new neighbor who had recently moved in, and he, oddly enough, had already seen enough of this inadequate HOA, so we quickly resolved the issue with the car. We called the representatives of the HOA, who were afraid of the sheriff, and we quickly resolved the issue on the spot. The HOA paid the price of the tow truck. But it wasn't over so quickly. We decided to use our savings to install a security system for our home and property, which included video surveillance cameras. Have you realized what we saw the first day these cameras were installed? Karens from the HOA sneaking onto our private property and slashing our tires. That's when we realized who had scratched them earlier. 
I think they felt very sorry that they had lost so much money on my car and its towing that they decided to destroy it. Of course, like most people in my situation, we went to court. The sheriff helped us a lot because without him, I don't know if we would have won so easily. But we did win, if we look back. These Karens didn't really want to prove anything because they had seen the video, which perfectly shows that it was definitely them. But they were so surprised that we had cameras that they came to destroy my car in the clothes they always wear. In the clothes they wear when they take pictures for the HOA website, showing how competently they spend the money of our neighbors who pay them fees. All of these Karens were jailed for about a year each and had to pay immense fines. Also, if anyone is wondering what all those neighbors who were turned against us think and say now, they apologize a lot and they say that they just didn't understand the whole situation and thought that we were bad people. Do you think we should forgive them? Because my family and I don't really want to forgive them. The next story is, Major company client blunders cost my company a staggering $7,000 and I have a paper trail that can get him fired. I formerly worked for a company whose major responsibility was to coordinate all the medical examinations and paperwork required for you to abide by the most recent occupational health and safety rules, as well as some particular labor laws. The situation is a little different because this is not the U.S. I won't go into the specifics of the technicalities. In the 1950s or 1940s, a tool shed in someone's backyard gave birth to a large firm in the area. Not just any company, a world-class enterprise. In any case, they developed to the point where they could acquire a smaller rival and enter areas that were closely related to their main offering. Imagine a large vehicle like a bus. There's a man who I will refer to as L.R., who works for this other company. L.R. appears to be a chill-ish guy at times, yet he's never there when you need him. Remember that when I say around, I mean at his desk on the branch office of his business in a tiny town a few states away, and he takes a while to respond to emails. It was my responsibility and that of my boss, this is a two-man department by the way, as I worked in the company's service provider relationship division, to get in touch with service providers, accredit new service providers, collect their workload, audit it, and if everything is in order, send their invoices to management for payment. Normally, we would both be able to fill in and audit the most of the tasks for our service providers within two to three days of their arrival, sometimes on the same day. However, this one wasn't that simple. As you can see, the majority of the 300 employees at the branch where LR works are assembly line workers. I'm referring to mechanics, electricians for vehicles, and welders as a whole. Naturally, these positions demand a variety of exams, blood tests, hearing tests, heart tests, eye tests, and vision tests must all be completed by a general practitioner. Oh, and the organization continues to hire individuals each month as well, so the number of tests is constantly increasing. We typically pay 20 to 24 grand a month in examinations for this one unique service provider, occasionally more than 30 grand. Because of the demand from us, most exams were actually quite affordable. Normally, it would take us at least a week to audit their workload, which involved receiving it, entering all the employee data, exams, and results, verifying that everything was properly logged in our database, and then auditing their invoice to make sure we were being charged the correct amount for everything. It's a 12-page invoice with a 7-point font. It was enjoyable, so... This started out nicely, then LR kept filling out the forms incorrectly, failing to identify which examinations the person needed to take, entering information for functions that didn't exist in our database, and sending the staff to take exams that they didn't require. Due to all of these errors, it took us anywhere between 7 and 10 days to pester him for input so that we could finish the process. Occasionally, he would delay longer and would only provide feedback when we were about to receive a whole new task from this service provider. My boss man and I tried our best, and we actually got along well with the service provider. They did everything they could to assist us, even doing part of the LR exams on-site. 
However, LR was not content. He caused us a lot of problems, primarily by blaming our service provider for all the errors and for the poor caliber of their job. As a result, once every two to three months, we would receive complaints from the commercial sector about the shoddy work the service provider was performing. At one point, the boss man, our manager, and a commercial representative had to drive to the company headquarters in the city to handle the situation. At the time, my boss and I also had to attend a meeting to explain to our management why we were having so many problems with this one particular customer. Since they paid us several thousand dollars each month in fees for the exams and for organizing who must do what and when, this was a huge issue. When we received the workload from December 2015 in January of early 2016, we anticipate it will be extremely small because most businesses typically scale back their operations during the holidays. Nope. LR sent practically all of the branch's employees to their tests in an effort to expedite his work so that he could likely take a break in January and possibly February as well. The surprising part is that he filled out the forms incorrectly once more, as we had anticipated, but this time it affected practically all of them rather than just a handful. When a form is incorrectly filled out, we notify the business and request feedback while describing the precise error. But in this instance, he never submitted any of the required exams that any of the employees were required to take. In accordance with standard protocol, the service provider in this instance would carry out all of the exams required by the Occupational Health Control Program for that particular function. We spent a week and a half typing in everything, double-checking it, and at the end, we sent him an email informing him that we would be charging him a little over $7,000 for periodic exams that were unnecessary because the prior ones were within the legal time frame and thus not needed until they were no longer valid. Some of the exams had to be performed once every two years, one year, and a handful of them every six months. After a month passes by, a very irate commercial representative calls us and claims that LR's boss is furious and won't pay. However, he had good reason to be furious because their overall income increased by 50% in that very month, reaching 21 grand. It seems that when LR's parent company's financial division questioned him about the enormous overcharge we were making, he blamed us, claiming that we never explained to him how to properly fill out the authorization papers. Because this was a huge client, and because keeping them happy meant keeping their parent business happy, our manager and commercial rep wanted our heads on a silver platter. When you make one of them unhappy, well, in a sense, this was our day of reckoning, the opportunity we had been waiting for to get back at LR for avoiding our calls and emails, for repeating the same gang errors every month, and for basically attempting to make it as difficult as possible for me, my employer, and our service provider to complete our duties with the least amount of hiccups possible. Fortunately, we were ready for today. We meticulously archived all of our email correspondence because, as you can see, we anticipated problems with LR from the beginning. With a copy of each email correspondence we had with LR over the course of two years on his errors in completing out the authorization forms, we sent his manager a nice little message. A handful of our email exchanges were as long as a newspaper, outlining every step of filling out the paperwork, contacting the service provider, and dealing with any potential problems in as much detail as humanly feasible. When his manager noticed this, he sent us a lengthy email of regret and assurance that he would check into the situation. He also promised that within a day or two, we would be resolving their issue with our commercial staff and approving the payment of our invoice. We were very relieved about that, and the person who took LR's position the next month was so much friendlier. Even though we continued to experience issues with incomplete forms, we spent far less time trying to resolve them via phone calls, emails, or refuting LR's continual complaints against us and our service provider. The lesson of the tale is to always leave a paper trail when interacting with a-holes. The portrayal of LR's behavior and the consequences showcase the importance of maintaining a thorough paper trail when dealing with difficult people. It's 
beyond frustrating to deal with someone who consistently makes mistakes and tries to shift the blame onto others. Good for the OP for keeping those emails. I've seen people have similar problems and they were not nearly as happy because they didn't keep a conversation log. The story serves as a valuable lesson for any professional facing similar challenges. Also, the importance of clear communication, documentation, and standing up for what's right is evident throughout the entire narrative. It's crucial to have evidence when dealing with difficult individuals who try to evade responsibility. It's also a reminder of the impact that one person's actions can have on an entire organization. OP's dedication to his job and attention to detail saved his company from a significant financial loss. It's unfortunate that LR's actions not only cost his company seven grand, but also jeopardized the relationship between your organizations. Thankfully, the thorough records and evidence helped expose his incompetence and led to his dismissal. By taking a proactive approach, the OP was able to protect your company's reputation and financial well-being. The next story is, Landlord was rude to me. So, I made him kiss goodbye to his place in the association. For three years, I rented the ground level of a three-story house. We promptly paid the rent, and other than a few occasions when anything required repair, we largely kept to ourselves. During that period, I got a dog, and my fiancé moved in together with me. I kept track of everything via emails, and they were both quite understanding about the price hikes. There were no issues, reduced to just five months until the third year of the lease comes to an end. We conclude that buying a starter home would make more financial sense because we'll be getting married in around six months. In order to inform them of our consideration of not renewing the lease and our reasoning, we really have to have a talk with them. Important information here, the landlords were a husband and wife reality couple who dabbled in both rental ownership and working as real estate brokers. Their website prominently carried the seal of the National Association of Realtors. Despite their apparent lack of concern, they showed a strong enthusiasm in working as our real estate agents. The offer's made, there's some back and forth, they accept, and the closing procedure is initiated. So, in accordance with the lease's terms, we offer our landlords a 60-day notice period. They lose it. I'll skip through a few weeks of turmoil and threats in favor of the big fight. They sue me for damages to the apartment before we have even left, despite the fact that they never officially added my fiancé to the lease, an essential point for later. Why? Because as they gloated repeatedly, they knew that even if my action against them was utterly frivolous, we couldn't close on a mortgage while it was still pending, and they gleefully pointed out that they could easily stretch out the appeals for years. After speaking with a lawyer, who kindly offered us a consultation at a significantly reduced rate because we were referred to him by the local bar association, it was essentially confirmed that what they were doing was extremely unethical, but not strictly illegal, and that it would be very simple for them to carry out, even if the lawsuit was wholly frivolous. We were ultimately able to close on the house after paying them $1,800 in blackmail and having to sign a confidentiality agreement with them. Now for the bit about getting even. Important information. Being an engineer who frequently collaborates with municipal organizations such as code enforcement divisions, I'm fairly knowledgeable about codes and how the system functions. In the county where I formerly resided, all rental homes must receive a certificate of occupancy, which necessitates a code inspection before they can be rented out for tax purposes. Since the majority of the residences in the neighborhood are between 50 and 100 years old, landlords frequently flout these laws because code enforcement personnel are frequently preoccupied with actively collapsing structures. So after a few months of preparation, I carried out my plan. I was able to generate a list of 15 rental houses they owned in the county, apart from the one that we lived in due to the NDA. After researching the property records in that county, conveniently all available online for free, a letter was put together after a quick weekend trip to snap a few photos of each house. A worried resident, aka my fiancé, had looked at a rental property but was worried about cracks in the basement foundation. Good luck finding a house that age without them. 
She wanted to make sure that they had been inspected for safety before the certificate of occupancy had been issued. Extremely unlikely that one had ever been applied for, given our landlords. Each township's code enforcement officer, tax collector, and township council received copies of the letters for every property held by each township. Over the following few months, she received multiple phone calls from the majority of the township officials, pressing for space. She continued to act as a prospective tenant who wanted to ensure that the homes were inspected. Since none of the ones she got a call back about had been registered or inspected, they were going to follow the rules now that everything was recorded in their books. Without knowing the precise figures, I estimate that it would cost at least tens of thousands of dollars to bring a 100-year-old home up to the current rental code, let alone 15 of them. This is without accounting for the fines and penalties for years of not paying the correct higher taxes on them. Surprisingly, we never heard from our former landlords, despite the fact that I like to assume that once the government's mountain of pain fell on them, they probably hired a lawyer with the wisdom to advise them to quit prodding the bear's ire. They appear to have only eight rental properties left in that county, according to a new search I recently conducted in the property records for them. It appears that the majority were sold within a year of our departure, some of them at a loss. By selling those properties at a loss and losing almost half of their rental revenue, not to mention the cost of bringing their other properties up to code, it appears that $1,800 in blackmail cost them almost $30,000 if we were the cause. The cherry on top? I copied my fiancé on a lengthy email chain from their business emails in which they admitted to engaging in some egregiously unethical, but technically legal, practices and conducted themselves in a completely unprofessional manner, such as admitting that the lawsuit was completely pointless, but that it didn't matter because I'd pay up if I ever wanted to see a mortgage. They were foolish enough to respond to everyone. So, using the links to each organization they so kindly provided on their website, my fiancé forwarded a copy of that entire email exchange to the ethics officer and president of the local chapter of the National Association of Realtors that they were members of, as well as the national ethics officer. She responded that because of the confidentiality agreement, we didn't think we could file an official complaint without getting into doubtful legal territory, but we wanted them to know what kind of people were abusing their organization's name and reputation. She received follow-up questions from both of them asking if she wanted to file an official complaint. They assured us that it was something that they would look into, but we never ended up receiving a response. When I visited their website tonight, all of the references to the National Associations of Realtors were gone, and the memberships list indicated that they were no longer a part of the regional organization either. I like to believe that we played a part in it. Now, this story is a good example of how revenge does not necessarily have to be malicious or harmful, but can instead be a clever and strategic response to injustice. While the initial situation with the landlords was discouraging, to say the least, I was so impressed by the protagonist's attempt to level the playing field, equipped with knowledge of municipal regulations and an understanding of how to handle ethic issues. It's clear to me that the landlords were morally wrong to attempt to extort the protagonist, and their unethical behavior did not stop there. By reporting the unregistered rental property to the appropriate authorities, the protagonist indirectly contributed to ensuring the safety and compliance of the property, while at the same time exposing the landlord's lack of compliance with the rules. And the icing on the cake was that he forwarded that email correspondence to the National Association of Realtors highlighting the unethical behavior of the landlords and getting them ultimately kicked out. I am so pleased that the association just took the appropriate action there and just removed those landlords from their membership. Thanks for watching. Just a reminder, subscribe, like, and comment.